in a time of stress, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall back to your training. And so the, the better you are in the fundamentals, the better you're going to be in a high stress situation. Well, because it's about getting those fundamentals into muscle memory, whether we're talking about photography as, as a process or the business that we're running, right? Or the client journey, it's the fundamental pillars that allow you to stay consistent. So if you don't have the muscle memory, then that competency falls back. Welcome to the Studio Takeover Podcast. I'm your host, Cat Ford Coates. Today, I am here with Noel Mercantile. And he and I connected at WPPI. He came through one of my photo walks uh, and it was on movement. So it was really more of like a fun experimental photo walk uh, to really kind of dial in how to expand on your style. And I love, I love the space that Noel, it's taking it. He sent me a couple of options and ideas that he was working on for a client incorporating that movement. Um, but I know he's doing destination work and a lot of headshots and really like stepping up his game and his business. So Noel, welcome. Kat, thank you so much for having me. I was delighted to meet you uh, in, the, um, in the photo walk over at WPPI. It was my first time over there. And I was, uh, I was floored with how much creative energy was there. And, um, and really, I, I kind of went through and, and f uh, figured out which photo walks that I wanted to take because I felt like I'd been kind of doing the same thing for a few mm -hmm. months, uh, maybe even a whole year. Just like I know how to, I know I've, I've sort of like perfected this formula, sure. but it's not as dramatic as I want it to be, I guess. I, guess I, I became numb to it. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, expand my brain. I want to soak up something from other people and try and inject some of it into, into my uh, existing formula so that it can be kicked up a notch. So movement in portraiture and movement in commercial work is something that I've, I've really ha enjoyed for a couple of years, but I hadn't done it consistently. It was sort of like a, oh, let's experiment. Oh, okay. Sure. I figured out that this is a thing we can do. I'll put it in the back of my brain and then at some point we'll break it out again and then you never do. So it was like a, it was like a supercharge uh, being in that, uh, in that space with you and a um, bunch of really friendly people, great model. And uh, I, I had a blast. And so I was like, all right, we gotta, we gotta start doing this. Uh, so I did it for uh, the NOLA gold rugby team. We have a, it's one of our, uh, most people don't even know that the United States has a professional rugby league, uh, but I do, I do all of their, all their in-studio photos preseason to get, you know, the hype photos and the, the stuff that goes on the billboards and stuff. And so I was like, I'm going to do this with these guys to, cause like, cause the motion is about like power and speed and quickness. Mm -hmm. So perfect place to put movement into photography. Well, and that's how you can kind of translate those skill sets in that visual communication right? Especially on a branding level. You know, uh, a really good friend of mine, her son, is, well, two of her sons are MMA fighters and they're the best in the world. Uh, and one of them just did this um, like reality show. It was filmed up in Canada and, you know, super hush hush, but the, the season is coming out now. Right. And I was just watching some of the, you know, the trailers they've got, but they're do things like incorporating movement, you know, from the video side and the photo side. Uh, and same kind of idea, right? It's to bring that the path of athleticism, right, mm -hmm. into a visual context so that it can be communicated without saying fighter or runner or rugby player. It's like, no, this. And yeah, so being able to expand our skill sets into the styles that we're already creating, right? And just you expand on those skill sets and then all of a sudden your capacity to execute on a higher level is what allows you to set your brand apart from other other portrait photographers for sure you know if you want results that nobody else has gotten you got to do things that nobody else is doing and nobody else around here is approaching branding that way and uh commercial work that way and so i want to do something that maybe is a little bit harder but gets better results I, I don't shy away from a challenge for, for some reason, I always tend to like do the, the most difficult thing 
because sure. I feel like I've always had something to prove since childhood. Uh -huh. uh, and so if there's something that I can do that's just a little bit more difficult, then uh, I'm going to go for it. Well, is it that it's more difficult or it's simply out of the ordinary? Mm. Well, I think that if it were if it were easier, it would certainly be certainly be more ordinary. Uh, it's it takes a little bit of timing, a little and a lot of patience. Um, it, I mean, obviously, it's the the knowledge of the technical side. You have to know, okay, movement movement happens when the shutter is open longer. Okay, now we have to uh, to allow for the shutter to be open longer. We have to do all of these different factors, and then you have to have the reflexes to be able to say, okay, the flash needs to fire at this moment. So yeah, I'd say it's a little bit more difficult, but in a rewarding way. Yeah. No, I love a good challenge. And when you start getting into motion and rear curtain sync and, and things like that, I'm realizing, you know, because, you know, during that photo walk, we were in just a conference room, right? So big overhead light everywhere. And typically with motion, you want to kill the ambient light. You want it mm -hmm. as dark as possible to really get that like painterly motion. But that's not to say like you can't experiment from both sides and say, OK, well, maybe I'm just going to use my shutter speed to kill this ambient as best I can. Right. And bring that motion in that way. But when you bring it into branding specifically, it allows you to set them apart the same way you've set yourself apart. So how did you get into the photo space? Like what made you turn around and be like, you know what? I'm going to run at this portrait branding. Like I'm going to find my niche. Like what was that journey like for you? It started out with survival mode, believe it or not. I was given a camera on a family vacation, one of those little disposable Fuji film with the green cardboard around it. Yep, well, yep. Uh, I've, still, I've got, I've got one somewhere around here that I keep as a souvenir, but, um, but yeah, I, and then I just filled it up and then my parents were like, oh, that was quick. I was like, can I have another one? And I, as soon as I got those first prints back, I was like, this is really cool. Yeah. I can't believe that, that this was the thing. So I would actually, I'd start posing my action figures and using a disposable camera. This is how young I was. I was like posing my Star Wars figurines into group photos. Uh, and then, and uh, then it just like, uh, and then my dad was like, all right, you may actually need a real camera. So uh, my first camera was a Canon AE-1 that had been collecting dust in, uh, in some box somewhere. And I just, I got, I got all into film and you know, when I was that young, I couldn't really develop it myself, but I would always, I'd go to, I don't know, Walmart or K&B back whenever K&B was a thing and do the photo uh, like do, do the one hour photo mm -hmm. developing and, and then eventually that, that went into college. And then I got my first digital camera in college and I was just shooting with my friends and I would bring it to, you know, the quad when everybody's playing Frisbee and, and chilling out and just sort of like finding those little moments of people laughing. And I was like, that's cool. Watch like getting photos of people laughing and enjoying themselves is really cool. So I graduated uh, college from LSU, go Tigers. And um, I also had graduated in, in the summers between college, I graduated from uh, officer candidate school with the Marine Corps. Okay. And so you can, you can do your training as an officer, at least like your entry level training before you finish college, go back, finish college, and then boom, you start your career. Only problem was, at the time that I came through, there was a backlog of qualified brand new lieutenants and not enough places for us at our next school. So there's thousands of people that are like, we can't give you orders because there's no space and there's too many of you and we, are, and we can't pay you because you're not uh, on orders. So right. don't die, don't get a, a DUI, stay in shape. Uh, Go get a job somewhere and figure out how to make money until an undisclosed date that we're going to finally give you this career that you've been qualified for. Um, so I was a bouncer and a busboy, and I was like, somebody might actually pay me to take photos. So, so I started my photography business as a survival mode, mm -hmm. working two, two uh, minimum wage service industry jobs and trying to make rent. So that was the first time I got paid. First time I got paid for uh, for my work with a camera, 
And uh, I ended up making a go of it because it was about a year. And I, I got hired as a photojournalist for a, a local magazine. So I was taking photos and I was writing and I was doing human interest stories and getting to take these cool portraits. Like, I, I didn't know what they were called at the time, but nowadays I know that they're called environmental portraits where you're taking human interest uh, portraits right. of people doing their thing and, and getting to write about it. And, and that gave me a relationship between story and image because I had to both write the story and take the images. Okay. So that, like, that drilled itself pretty deep in my brain. Uh, and then I went to, I, and then I finally got, after about a year, I finally got my active duty orders and I kept my camera with me. And I was always the guy who brought the camera into the field. And so I had access to something that most photographers oh. will never have access to. Well, and now you've so, got experience in incorporating the environment to tell the story. Yeah, so that's so I thought I was going to be a photojournalist. I thought that I was going to be like the next Steve McCurry or something like that. Uh, that's not what ended up happening because I fell in love with studio photography. I still I fell in love with portraits. And that was probably around 2016, 2017. I got out of the Marine Corps. Well, in 2016, I got out of the Marine Corps. But 2017 is when I really started my business. And I moved back to Louisiana. New Orleans is now home. I was like, okay, I got to figure out how to make money with this for real. Mm -hmm. And I listened to a lot of business podcasts. Special place in my heart for photography business podcasts. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, it was a long, long road. And I was just like, okay, I, I you need to leverage my network of people from college and from growing up to try and get a foothold in this thing. Um, and it was a struggle and it was a real struggle. And then around, I think 20, late 2016, maybe eh, it might've been mid 2017. I was listening to Andrew Helmich's podcast and Mike Schacht was a guest. And he's, uh, he's, one of P he's one of the mentors with the Headshot crew. Okay. And I was so impressed by the interview that I reached out to him on Facebook. And he was nice enough to answer and, uh, and said, yeah, if you, if you want to get serious about headshots and you really want to be good at headshots, you got to join the Headshot crew. Oh, yeah. So that's what I did. And I got my ass kicked. <laughs> and uh, until, until, uh, until I didn't suck as much. And then I got my ass kicked a little less. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, I, I'm a competitive person. So the fact that they had a competition format, I like, I sunk my teeth into that. <laughs> I love, I love it. I love competing. And so getting to compete in photography is awesome. And that's like a regular thing that they do in Headshot Crew, right? Every week. And Every so, week. I, I, so I went from, so I went from getting my ass in, uh, kicked in the contest to now judging the contests. Uh, whenever, you know, my rotation comes up, if, mm -hmm. uh, if Peter can't be there to judge cause he's got a shoot or whatever, he's traveling or whatever, then one of us, one of us, uh, on the mentor side and the associate side takes over judging. So, uh, it's absolutely surreal to have gone from, from me thinking that I was the shit and I was like, Oh, my work is so good. I get there and they're like, sit down, okay. you know, sit, sit down and shut up. And we're going to tell you exactly what you did wrong so that you could fix it. But that's the thing. Right. It wasn't like you, it wasn't like you suck go away. It was like you suck, but here's why. So come back and we encourage you to come back next week and suck a little less. Do it again. It was hard work, but I mean, I've, I've never seen anybody take pride in something that was easy. So now I'm glad they were hard on me. Well, you know, and in the moment, like when you do, you're like really proud of it. And somebody's like, Let's talk about it. And you're like totally deflated. <laughs> but once you've actually like, every processed entry. it, right? You've processed it and you're you're going, man, I'm so glad that happened. That allowed me to appreciate how to evolve instead of just you keep trying and you don't know what you don't know. Right. So I remember I was uh every once in a while I'll dig up like early, early stuff, like 2012, 2013. And I'll put a side by side for people. And it's typically is like a sign of encouragement. Like if that's what it looked like and I still build a business, like you can do it too. Right. Oh yeah. 
but it wasn't until like you kind of get your ass handed to you from the technical side of things. But if people are just berating your work for the sake of it without giving any kind of constructive critique, then they're just being dicks. But when you have an opportunity to actually give somebody that critique that is going to help them evolve, like in your position, right? Like you came in and now you're mentoring, you're in that space where you're able to give that critique back. It's rising tides lift all ships, man. Like that's awesome. Oh, I, I totally agree. And there's, and there's some stuff that I, uh, I still learn from people. And I know I can't remember who said it, some, some old guy probably, but uh, one of the best ways to learn is by teaching. Mm-hmm. And, and I think maybe more precisely, one of the best ways to remind yourself of the fundamentals is by teaching them. Yeah. Uh, because I've, I've gone back, I've gone back, like I've helped, um, I've helped Peter teach it, like, uh, at, like some of the intensives that he does and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. That's always fun too. And listening to him, uh, listening to him give people the, the, uh, the spiel from the ground up, I get reminded of stuff that I forgot. I get reminded of stuff like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's the easier way to do this. And it's, and it's great because then I get to turn around and, and then reinforce that with people. And then it's just digging itself further into my brain because I'm a big, I'm a big believer that you don't rise to the occasion. You fall back to your highest level of like solid competency. Mm. In a, in a time of panic, we, 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 it was kind of a thing from the Marine Corps, like at a time of, in a time of stress, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall back to your training. And so the, the better you are in the fundamentals, the better you're going to be in a high stress situation. Well, because it's about getting those fundamentals into muscle memory, whether we're talking about photography as, as a process or the business that we're running, right. Or the client journey, it's the fundamental pillars that allow you to stay consistent. So if you don't have the muscle memory, then that competency falls back. You know, I say that to people who are, who are coming into my coaching, right. It's Look, it's not about following the new fancy way of doing any of it. It's about doing the fundamentals really, really well. And one of my coaches taught me that. He's like, fuck all the rest of it. It's about the fundamentals. You rinse and repeat until you're so good at them. Like everybody's experience, like it may seem cookie cutter to you, but to them, like it's the most emboldening experience they've ever had with somebody in your zone right in Mm -hmm. the portrait space or the branding space. And you don't have to do all the things. You just do those fundamentals really, really well. And then you can scale. So when people come in and I'm like, you don't get to cherry pick, you can't cherry pick the recipe. It's not like, well, I don't want to do that. Or I don't want to say this. Like all of it is very crucial that you rinse and repeat for this system to work. But once you've got it unlocked, that's when you can start refining, but you can't refine Jack until you've got that <laughs> blindfolded and hands tied behind your back because you don't know yeah. why. Part of the genius of Picasso, let's say, is if you look at Picasso's earlier work, he was technically sound. He could, he could, I mean, he had the, he had the fundamentals down pat. He like, he was a traditionally classically trained artist and a very good one. He didn't start being abstract because he couldn't figure out how to do the basics and was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go do something weird and just call it my style and avoid doing the work. No, he did the work and he knew exactly what he was doing. So he knew why he was doing something different. And the same thing is true for your photography, right? Like you were saying is I thought I was doing really well. And then really like from a professional scale like maybe i wasn't where i thought i was and but i was given that insight and now you're in a position to be able to do that with you know the people that are on the up and coming you know what does that look like in your world are you gonna stay in the mentoring position are you looking at teaching as a revenue stream are you like you know what we're just gonna go full destination and (laughs) screw the rest right i i it's I find I find uh, the teaching side almost addictive. Hmm. I I get I, my adrenaline 
and endorphins just go through the roof whenever I get to coach somebody or somebody somebody pulls me aside, like let's say we're at a, we're at a headshot crew something, and somebody pulls me aside and says, hey, Noel, can you help me with this? That's like, the, that's like music to my ears. I love it. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's break it down because, because I know that it's, I know that it's difficult to grasp at the beginning and you're like, I don't see what, I don't see what he's seeing. I, I don't get, like, I don't see what he's, um, I don't see the thing that he told me I got wrong. I said, okay, well, we're going to do this by repetition. I'm going to show it to you so many times that you can't get it wrong. And, uh, and that's just, just the coolest thing is to see the light bulb go off and for them to, uh, and then they, and then they shoot it and then they look at the, at the laptop. Cause of yeah. course we're all shooting tethered. We're all, you know, we're like, it's like a, it's like a meme at this point. <laughs> um, all photographer, all, all headshot crew photographers have to shoot tethered. It's in the Bible. <laughs> uh, the moment they look at that laptop screen and they see it, they see what, like they see the difference. Mm-hmm. That's just, that's just so much fun. Uh, and then, and then to see the people that I coached go associate it's like proud dad moment of like yes but that's also it's also good advice that i got on my side of things was don't be afraid to ask people for advice in your career because then they become invested in your success i like when you give advice to people you don't want to see them fail like like you're like your mentees you want to see them succeed because you have your thumbprint on it well, and their so, success is our success, right? Like, right, right. Then it becomes testimonial. It's now proof of concept, right? Like there's tangible evidence. And it's not just that. I mean, it's on a spiritual level, on an emotional level. I, I love seeing people that I've helped succeed. And so you can kind of reverse engineer that process. And, and I can ask other people for advice. And then uh, since they've given me advice, they don't want to see me fail afterwards. Sure. So it's, a, you know, it, it, because it makes them feel good to, uh, to give advice to somebody who later succeeds. So that's, that's, a, that's something that I would tell like anybody who's listening, who's just starting out is ask for advice, because then you're going to, uh, you're going to gather this team around you who is all invested in your success, because they've oh, got their fingerprint on it. On. Cheering you on, like, you know, being a solopreneur, right, like, is isolating you know, a one man band and you're having to be multifaceted, right? So it's not like the best version of me. It's about like, okay, there's the CEO version of me there. There's the marketing version of me. There's the photographer version of me. There's the artist version of me because those two things can be mutually exclusive. There's also the blogging version of me and the SEO version of me and the accountant version of me. And, you know, like that list goes on and you just keep realizing like, how alone you are and that loneliness really like closes those blinders in pretty hard. And when you're able to ask people for advice, join things like the headshot crew, right? Like now you're a part of a community and those people are all doing that thing together and they're putting their own flavor on it. Everybody's got their own style. Like even if they're trying to master somebody else's style, whether that's Peter or Sue or, you know, insert name here, that mastery is helping you to weave community into your path. And with that community, whether it's from mentees or other people that are doing the work with you, now all of a sudden, it's not quite so lonely. And the problems that you're facing are actually normal. You're not an idiot. You're not being a dumbass. <laughs> it's actually something. Well, don't speak too soon word. for me. <laughs> don't speak too soon for me. I might very well be an idiot, and I just haven't figured it out yet. Uh, crazy talk. Crazy talk. The community is is uh, is super important, and um, uh, not to not to make everything about the uh, uh, headshot crew, but uh, that's that's. Uh, I feel like we are annoyingly positive. Like we are we are obnoxiously good friends with each other, and uh, we have more fun than than people should have at professional gatherings no way uh, but then no again, such thing but but there's a lot of that going on just in general like I said places like wppi which is which is great um but it's yeah it's, it's and it, and you can be vulnerable with with people too you can i mean you're all walking on the same journey you're all trying to get to the same place uh and i like it um 
Headshot Hideaway up in the up in the Tennessee mountains this past fall. Um, you know, 2023 was uh, was a rough year uh, for for me in my business. It was the first year in six years where I hadn't outgrossed my previous year. Oh. And so you're like, okay, what happened? And the autopsy of 2023 was basically the market took a hit. Um, it, there was an official announcement of a recession, which affects commercial clients' ability, like uh, willingness to go right. spend money. And also I, I built out this studio. This was a four month, pretty intensive build where I had to turn down a lot of work because it's like, do we build or do we shoot? Or do we, do we build today so that we can shoot later? Do we dig this hole to build the foundation? So we had to dig a hole to build the foundation upon which this now like rose from, uh, from the ground up. And I'm looking around and I'm like sort of nudging my friends and I'm like, hey, uh, did 2023 suck? And they're like, yeah, 2023 sucked. I'm like, okay. I'm like, okay, next person come join the conversation. Did 2023 suck? And they're like, yeah. And these are people from all over the country. And they're like, yeah, we like, you're not alone. 2023 sucked, but we're going to get over it because 2024 is going to be better. So, uh, and it already has like, of course, (laughs) (laughs) people spend money in an election year. It's, it's, uh, it's so funny. Um, there's just like, it's so funny how all these things in, in, in business and uh, in business and people's mental spaces is all connected mm-hmm. and, the, and the economy kind of follows suit. So being able to, being able to play that, ride that wave is, uh, it's tricky, but it, you have to do it. And it turns out, yeah, like 2023 was, building the launch pad so that we could put right. the rocket of 2024 on it and then light that sucker up because Q1 was fantastic. I'm like, I'm like, did, did somebody flip a switch on December 31st? <laughs> like, was this organized? Which is interesting because a lot of the photographers that I speak to are like, what's going on? Q1, like what happened? Right? Like business is way down, but they're not tracking it back to 23, they're saying, you know, this issue. And so you're looking at 23 and going, I didn't outgross 22, but also like your profit margin took a hit because of the build out, right. And the slow of business during that four month space. So not only was it like, okay, maybe even if the numbers were the same from 22 to 23, that actually means there was growth, right? Because you had four months where you really couldn't work. Mm-hmm. at the pace in which you're used to but having the the community there to like no bro you're good man like it's just been a weird year uh yeah it, it was it was a weird year um and and th- th- see there you go introducing facts and logic and and oh, I know. perfectly reasonable explanations in there d- totally destroying my self-defeating narrative look at you <laughs> i have the habit of doing that <laughs> You have that, you have that, that, that pesky ability to objectively uh, look at things. To actually yeah. show you that there was growth because you were closed for a, an entire quarter. <laughs> it's, it's an adventure for sure. Business is an adventure. I, I know that there's, like, I've got a couple of great friends. They pride themselves on being more, more business people than photographers. Mm-hmm. And I honestly, I would rather be a photographer. The numbers are not my strong suit. I do it because I have to do it because I've got a family to feed and because I enjoy playing golf once every six months and those green fees aren't, uh, aren't cheap. If I want to give my kid the life that, you know, I was blessed to have growing up, then I, I have to run it like a business because my, my father was a businessman, uh, still is a businessman. And I can't just be like the, the psychedelic creative one, because it, that's not me anyway, but two, because this has to work. I, during the pandemic, there was a, about a three day period where my entire family, this is after three months of, of not being allowed to work. Mm-hmm. My entire family said, it's not your fault. It's okay. You can give up now. It's not oh, your yeah. fault. This is, this was out of your control. You're a good photographer, but no one wants to pay what you're worth. 
and it's not your fault that this pandemic happened and ruined your business. So mm-hmm. we will not we will not judge you if you, you want to go get a job. If you want to go find a different job, and and I spent three days mulling over this, where this could this was actually a possibility. Mm-hmm. I have never felt so physically ill, save the time I got food poisoning. Right? It was like if it was like food poisoning. Those three days of of actually mulling this over and actually considering giving up on photography. Um, and I was like, if, if I go get another job, I'm going to spend all day, I'm going to be terrible at that job because I'm going to be spending all day thinking about photography. I'm going to be the worst employee to, to anybody else. If, you know, right. if, 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 if there's no creative aspect to what I'm doing, if it's not like being a creative director for a marketing agency, whatever, and then nobody's going to hire me for that anyway. If it's not something like that, I'm going to be the worst employee ever. So I should just double down and um, make it work. And yeah. And my girlfriend at the time, now wife, what, it was like, she like, she's, she, she kind of like closed ranks with me and was like, J- just give him a year. Just, just give him a year to get out of his system. And if he makes it, he makes it. If he doesn't, he doesn't. And then I think it was like May. Oh no, it was like, it was t- toward the end of April. I get a phone call on the business line, first phone call on the business line in quite some time. And she's like, have you, uh, or given the availability at the end of May, which is when we're finally allowed to start right. operating as a business again. And I thought it was a jo- I thought it was a sick joke. I was like, I was like, this is, this is a prank. Somebody's playing on me. This is really cruel. And I don't know why she booked me because I did, I did not have my sales persona on <laughs> during that during that call so you're like um, i but, charge x y and z and whatever lady is this like who sent you <laughs> pretty good impression pretty good impression of me trying to put on a brave face while i'm like my like, you know this is this is my dream and it's all going down the toilet uh and then another booking came in and then another booking came in and then it came back with a vengeance because people all of a sudden had to really care about what they put online right because everything was happening online and people realized it. And 20, the second half of 2020 out earned the entirety of 2019. Nuts. Actually, yeah, that was pretty true. We, uh, my COVID was, I spent like three months drinking tequila in my backyard. Like, okay, cool. I get to slow down for a minute. Cause I'd been on the road, <laughs> like November of 2019, I was in Bali and then I was in Vegas and I was in New York then I was in Arizona and all of that before, you know, St. Patty's Day of, of 2020. You know, because it was like, everybody stay home in a couple of weeks. We can all go back. And we were like, okay, two weeks. Cool. Yeah, two weeks. And uh, everybody, everybody was pretty, pretty game to like experiment for two weeks. Like we're like, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll like, we'll, we'll, we'll enjoy a novelty for two weeks. And then after two weeks, it's like, mm-hmm. we're having a hard time paying bills. Yeah. Like I haven't paid my mortgage. What's going on? And then I was like, okay, you know, I could coast through on savings maybe through like july or august for the business but like i wasn't trying to carry you know payroll and all the things and i couldn't do a ppp loan because my staff were all contractors so i was Mm -hmm. just like it's fine you know it's just a couple weeks we can coast on savings and then a couple months and i was like all right and so we put a campaign together but same kind of thing was like oh okay we're taking, all right, I got to go clean the studio and put this together. And we shot 42 people in five weeks, 46 people. Yeah. Floodgates opened. Floodgates opened and it was game on because everybody, everybody was like, my online brand sucks. And now everything is happening online and everything's moved online and I can't fall behind my competitors. And I said, I can help. Let's go. Let's do it. I've adopted this kind of saying that I that I say to myself, which is head in the game, heart on fire. Ooh, I like that. But you know, you have to be focused, you gotta make the preparations, you gotta be good on the technical side. And then whenever you see the results, allow yourself to take joy. Mm. Like don't don't just be like like furrowed brow all the way through, like focus, deliver, and then whenever you see your client light up. 
allow yourself to light up to. Our job is to feel good. Like that is the purpose of being a human is to feel good and enjoy this experience, right? You don't come into this space and start a business because you don't enjoy shooting. You don't enjoy the impact that it has. You know, I have a student and she's really trying to connect the dots between like what she does and how it impacts people on more than just a, you get pretty photos level. And I'm like, really? Like, do you light up when you shoot? Do you have fun? Like dance around, stomp? Like I stomp, right? When I know I get the shot, I'm like, yeah. Right, but it's about the joy of it. And there's so much of running a business that is outside of the joy, right? That is just like the things we have to do. But when you can, you know, allow your heart to be on fire with the people you're working with, with the work that you're creating on how you're expanding, you know, your capacity. You know, I, I don't take joy in the, in the, uh, in the invoicing and the, um, you know, the, like uh, the, the invoicing and the tax filing and the, sure. and the, uh, you know, answering all these emails and putting together presentations and stuff like that. I do take joy in the thrill of the sale. So, um, so like I, it's like my, my images are, are sold individually at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a method that a lot of people you, uh, use, you're probably very familiar with that. And so it's like, like, it's almost like the, there's a, there's a thrill there whenever somebody is so in love with the work that they're, you know, that they're like, yeah. you know, it's like 12 images and they're having a hard time narrowing it down beyond that. And I'm like, this person got a lot out of it. This person got a lot out of it and we're going to be paying credit cards. We're going to be paying off. We're going to be, we're going to be, paying off credit cards. This is great. They get, I get to pay off credit cards and they get to get to have something that they value highly. So it's that like that thrill, that thrill definitely happens. Like I know a lot of photographers hate sales. Oh, wait, They're like, I oh, love I love it. shooting and I love shooting and hate sales. I love the sales part. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, uh, it's exhilarating. It's fun. Well, because you know what you've created, right? Like when you organize the, the session correctly, they get to see different versions of themselves that maybe they haven't seen in a while right or versions of themselves they're trying to embody moving forward well now they get like tangible evidence of that right mm -hmm. in a photo and it is exciting when they can't narrow it down right and like i teach a really specific sales process that's you know post session you know la 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 but it's really about getting them to embody like all of the versions, the the positive, the negative, the shadow, the highlight, you know, so that when you're having those days, and we all know those days where you're just mm -hmm. like, I can't today. I just can't people. <laughs> I can't. I can't. And there's that version. You're on your you. fifth espresso shot and you're yeah. like, still, still not, still nothing. You get it. <laughs> still nothing. Yeah. And there's that version of you staring back at you, right? That's maybe it's your LinkedIn shot, right? Or you've got a piece on the wall or, you know, insert presentation here. Maybe it's the wallpaper on your phone to remind you that you deserve a little bit of grace and you're whole. It's okay. Put the espresso down. Take a shower, <laughs> maybe a nap and move on yeah that was that was one of our another one of our things that i brought over from the marine corps was the 15 minute nap mm -hmm. if you can if you can learn so I was, I was a tanker and so it's like if you can learn to take a 15 minute nap on a tank you are gonna learn how to re-energize yourself for you know another three days because mm. sometimes we were up for three days straight and it's just like you know there there is no like okay lights out at 10 o'clock and everybody get a <laughs> no. nice eight hours. No, you like, you take it where you can get it, whatever, whatever you have to do to, to, to make yourself feel like you are going to put energy into that next shoot. So like, it's like for me, if it's like, uh, there's some days where if it's like a meeting, I'll be like, all right, um, I got half an hour before this meeting. I'll bet you I can knock out two more proposals. Okay. Ready? Stopwatch. Go. If it's half an hour before a shoot, I'm like, mm -mm. I am gonna, 
I yeah. may respond to one email, but I am just I'm just gonna zen out. I'm gonna store up a store up a little bit of energy, chill out, yeah. uh, because because my like my money is made once the person gets in, and like and they get that experience from me. That's where I make my money. It's not from responding to this email. I can do that afterwards, but if if I put all my energy into this this computer screen that's in front of me and I have none left over for the person that walks through those doors. Yeah. I'm doing Money's them a disservice. That connection for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Very much, very much people. Um, I, I, I heard a, uh, I heard a great little piece that somebody said a couple of years ago. said, what's, what's your excuse? And it's basically, what do you really love? And then you find a career that is an excuse to do it. And I really love people and I, I, humans are friggin' amazing. I love humans and photography is a great excuse to meet new people and to connect with them and to, and to, to show them something about themselves that they either forgot about or they never knew was there. Mm-hmm. Well, so, that's, that's my tangible excuse. evidence, man, tangible evidence. <laughs> Share your story far and wide, and you can do that visually. You can speak it out. You can write it out, right? But it's about how just the presence of this experience as a human being, right, allows us to connect with others and impact their lives the way they impact ours. Uh, And I know it's really easy for us to all kind of put our blinders up and pretend we're special, fancy little unicorns. But really, at the end of the day, like, we're all here for connection. If you're a photographer and you're and you feel alone, like you said earlier, find a community. If if it's photographers, great. If it's not, go. Um, I would never advise anybody ever take a pickleball, but uh, find I don't know a chess club. Uh, so you know a dog park where you, where you see the same owners all the time. Something I don't know. Yeah. And then, so I, I actually, I actually have a question for you because this is something that, that I've personally struggled with in my business. And it's, uh, one of the things that, one of the things that, uh, I know you've talked with other guests about failing forward. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I failed at in the beginning was, um, failure to bring up the uncomfortable conversation of licensing Mm -hmm. and like, like commercial licensing and branding photography and, and whatnot. And I see in, in photography forums, people are going back and forth. People are battling. They're like, licensing is over. Just give it up. You'll never get it. No one wants to pay it. And then you get the other photographers who are like, I, I find myself on this side. No, they, like if they're going to use it for billboards or national ad campaigns, you need to get paid a greater amount for that. So you have, so licensing has to be uh, has to be in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm actually curious as to what your take on that is. I am actually in the, I don't want to say middle of the road there, but I look at branding in the space of, you know, if I understand what the usage is, right? So if they're going to put it on a billboard, Times Square, la la la, like, I'm happy to allow that. I draw the boundary at third party sell. So if they want to take that image and then sell it to generate money on their end, then we talk about licensing. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we get it, whether we're talking like book jackets, not so much, but a book cover is another story. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> right. But, you know, if you want to slap it on a coffee mug or sell an NFT of my work, then we're going to have a different conversation around what that looks like on a contract. But if right. you want to put it on a billboard, go for it. Because all that says is, well, now that I know it's going on billboards in these cities, now I'm connecting with people in those cities. Hey, send me, send me the shot of that billboard. There's a billboard over on 40 on its uh, going over to Knoxville. Like, will you, will you snap it next time you go through? Like that kind of thing. Um, Cause I can build up some social proof with that and attract other mm-hmm. customers that way. Um, now, if it's, say it's Coca-Cola, right? And we're talking like big international brands and they're putting it on a can and then that can is on the billboard. Then we're going to talk about licensing. 
The right. second they're making money on it versus attracting their client, because those are two different things. They're attracting their ideal client. That's what I'm here for, for them mm -hmm. to generate interest and get attention. But the second money comes, I get paid. Hmm. That's a good perspective because I haven't heard anybody really take the middle of the road uh, on it, but I think that makes a lot of sense. I've, I've only heard people talking about the extremes, so that's refreshing to hear that. Yeah. No, because I mean, I price, I price my work well enough to where I feel good that I produced it with you. Like, I'm happy for you to use it until we hit that boundary. Now, for destination work, it's a little bit different because you have to line item your crew, right? But mm -hmm. for like being here in the studio, I'm not going to charge extra for an assistant. I'm going to have that assistant there. That's built into my cost. Right. Right. Like I'm not going to charge a gear rental fee because I'm using my equipment and, you know, like we're getting into tax season and, and all the things. Right. Like my costs are all built into that. Now, when we expand that offering, right? So if hair and makeup is included with one person and we bring three more people in, well, yeah, I'm going to charge extra for hair and makeup for those other three people. I'm not going to charge you to have an assistant to support you having an amazing experience. No way. I'm building yeah. that. Yeah, that's already built in. Yeah. yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I would build in. And it's, and it's, already, it's already built in if, if they need, because uh, like for a regular headshot session, I don't need an assistant here but mm -hmm. if they want um you know if they want like an extra hour of branding session it probably means that we're going to be doing a lot of heavy lifting with the lights mm -hmm. like with the lighting equipment to do a, and, and we're and we want to change those setups around quickly because i because right. there's a ton of variety that i try to pack in there mm -hmm. and so yeah the assistant's going to be just going to be there they're not going to know that that's part of the cost but it's going to be in there well sure i mean overhead is overhead um, but it's not something that I'm just tacking on after the fact. Right. Uh, so right. that's just kind of how I, I look at it. Like my costs, I build out my pricing based off of what I know it's going to cost me. Right. And then additional value there so that I feel well compensated for what I'm earning because knowing that you're only really keeping 30, 35% of whatever it is that you're ringing. Like that's a tough nut to crack. Sometimes you're just like, I made what? Okay. It's time it's yeah. time to raise my prices now. <laughs> those, those pesky those pesky profit margins. Oh, I you love them. I love them. Yeah. Love them, love them. And, and that's kind of the funny that's kind of the funny thing is is when when a client will say, you know, uh they'll say, "Oh, that's so expensive. I can't believe you made that much money." And in the back of my head, I'm like, "I didn't make it." No, 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 no. That got spread around. Yeah. I guess spread around my insurance company made some money off of that. My, uh, my marketing person made money out of that. My assistant made money out of that. Yeah. Well, so and that's, and know, that's always favorite. a funny thing too. I was talking with my, my CFO and I was like, you know, it's so funny. I work so hard. You know, it's not like, oh, I work so hard, but like I expend <laughs> energy and time and resources to build this space and perfect and, you know, master my craft and get better every time I shoot. Why does the government make as much off of my back as I do? And then he was that like, That is a Potter, fantastic question. Are you a Republican or a Democrat? And I was like, Don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in favor of, of uh, people who are good at what they do getting paid to, you know, getting paid to, to lead a life that, that um, is secure and safe yeah. and and uh upholds dignity and i and i don't you know there's actually been a couple of memes going around about um you know uh why are people why are people so focused on attaching a human's worth to how much their salary is mm -hmm. and i think there's i think there's a lot to be said for that like like your job doesn't determine your worth right and your your salary doesn't determine your worth like there's people um there's, there's people who are, they, they deserve to be billionaires and they're like, and they're not, you know, they're in careers, they're not paying them well, sure. but I want them all to come into the studio because I, I will make them feel like a billionaire. Oh, I, I want them to feel like a tech billionaire whenever they, they come in for their shoot. And 
So I, I try to see that value in every human. And it's, and I, I have a hardest, I have the hardest time whenever somebody's like, um, oh, I, um, I, I don't look good in photos or I'm not photogenic or mm-hmm. I have a hard time registering that because I will find something cool about their face. I am determined well, to, to yeah. do that. It, that's a pretty common objection, right? Like, oh, you're going to have such a hard time photographing me. I've never liked a photo of myself. I'm not good in front of a camera. I never know what to do with my face or my hands or a rat, right? But really all that is, is whomever has photographed them in the past hasn't taken the time or the energy to find something about them as a person that just allowed them to shine and exist in that moment instead of Mm -hmm. making encouraging that discomfort, right? Have you ever had the photographer who doesn't give you direction, right? And you're just like, (laughs) right? Like, like, oh no, just stand, just, yeah, sit there, sit there and smile. What? (laughs) I don't know what this looks like, right? Like, yeah. So it's another one of the things that I learned from, uh, from Peter was like the direct direction versus indirect or uh, versus misdirection. Mm-hmm. So direct direction being like, all right, uh, drop this shoulder, put the chin here, put, you know, squinch the eyes and all that kind of stuff. And then the misdirection being just saying something that's completely out of left field right. to both break the tension and get them to forget that they're supposed to be nervous in front of the camera. Yeah. So that's been, that's the, that's the reason why I put so much energy into it and why I need to, I need to charge up before I start a session is because I'm putting, I'm, I'm, it's like a two hour improv session where I have to, I have to learn a little bit about them just enough to then make jokes about it and riff off it and, and try to, try to, try to get them to, or try to engage with them with humor about things that they like. So I, I've, I've been interested in a lot of things over the years and I've learned, a, and I, I love learning about things and new things. And so I, if, I, if I poke and prod enough and, and ask just the right questions and get a little bit of information, I can usually find something that I, that I have in common with them. And then I can, and then I can just uh, use that to just distract them because right. they have it in their brains that they're supposed to be nervous, that they're supposed to be self-conscious because right. they've psyched themselves up to be that. Uh, and then you just say something off the wall and all the tension is broken. They forget that they're supposed to be nervous because they're just laughing. And that's, that's what I, that's what I think the real magic is, is I, I've seen a lot of photographers who uh, shoot in, in really great light and the person looks like dead behind the eyes. They're just like, there's just nothing there. And I'm like, the technical side was great. The, the human side was just not there. Yeah. Well, and that's really like the, the essence of a great portrait is by leaning in and, you know, having that, the lights go on, right? Because we can all have listening face, right? Where the eyebrows go up and you're listening and the shoulder comes forward and you're bringing the chin around and you're like, okay, it's like, okay, <laughs> relax the forehead, right? But if I'm still just paying attention to what my shoulder's doing or what that elbow's doing, I'm not lit up. So it's about connecting with the person in that moment. And for me, it's usually something really stupid. Like if they're not giving me anything, it's all right. This is not a school picture from when you were in seventh grade and you felt like hell. This is like no school picture smile. This is just about the moment. Right. And they're like, oh, OK, you're right. I love it. At the end of the session, I'll, I'll, I'll show people that they did a really, you know, they will see that there's something's different. Like this doesn't look like anything that I've had before. And I'll tell them, I'm like, I'm like, you're going to be scrolling through LinkedIn tomorrow and you're going to see a whole lot of people with fake smiles. And for the first time you are going to know that those are fake smiles and you're going to know why those are fake smiles and you won't be one of them. Well, and that kind of connection is what like step one to elevating their brand above all of that nonsense above the, $50 $50 photographer above the boyfriend with the iPhone, right? Cause they're cutting corners as they build the brand, like having that kind of connection 
is what allows your audience to connect with you and your brand. They can't recognize themselves in your brand as you holding the success that they desire. It's all subconscious. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that fascinates me the most is that it's, it's our job to know what triggers different responses in the audience. Sure. And so we have to know that on an academic level so that then we can trick the subject into, into doing it naturally. And then that's going to help them because they, because when their audience sees that their audience is going to be, is going to, you know, they're going to have that trigger go off in their brains of, oh, this person's trustworthy. Right. This person looks like an expert. This person looks like he should be on the cover of Forbes and people who are on the cover of Forbes are experts. Unless they have a blood testing company, then they might not. In then fact, they be definitely are no expert, longer yeah. <laughs> experts, Absolutely. even though they're on the cover of Forbes. Uh, but, <laughs> Forbes but, was like, but even, oops. <laughs> and even and even that like and even that photo looked creepy. But yeah, even but even I can look at those photos and be like and be like, uh, either she either she purposely didn't take direction, or there wasn't a whole lot of direction given there. Um, Probably, but, but it, both. Probably yeah, maybe. I I don't know who took them. I'm sure they're great, great photographer. Um, see, now I'm gonna have to go down the Google rabbit hole and see. I I'm afraid that it's going to be somebody that I know, so I'm not <laughs> going to. And they're just like, I'm not down, not happening. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna Google that because I don't want I don't want to I don't want to embarrass myself by finding out it's somebody I know. Um, but the the, but the, but that's that's the thing for me. This the thing for me is the human connection, and and putting something out there that it doesn't look like everything else because we took a little bit of extra time and I was a little bit pickier, and it, and it was like the amount of photos that I'll go because I'll go through and I'll pre cull while they're changing outfits mm -hmm. and then so that I I know I'm not showing them everything at the end. I'm showing them the stuff that actually has a chance to make it. And I used to show people a hundred images and now it's like, I'm showing them 50 because if we're going to cull it down to less than 20 anyway, then why would I show you, why would I show you the top hundred where you're going to like, there's a whole, where 50 of them, you're going to feel like, why did you show me this? Why wouldn't I just show you 50 and you feel good about all of them, but you know, you have to make choices and then we start from there. Oh, see, I, I do not agree. Um, because I used to call down and I was like, OK. And then I would have customers that like, well, what about the rest of these things? And they're like, you know, most 90 percent of them are like, no, I trust you, like whatever. But then mm -hmm. I like experimented and I started showing everything. And I found a couple of a couple of different points. One. Having the blurs out of focus, blinks, like weird face moments <laughs> right next to an intentionally lit and posed and connected piece only adds value because now they can okay. see it side by side. And secondly, they were choosing expressions that I would not. Hmm. Okay. And a confident Interesting. customer is empowered to make their own decisions and purchase from you. So hmm. why take any of their power away? Show them everything. Let them stay in complete control and give them opportunities to say no to you 80 times so there is no buyer's remorse. If Ooh, you have them saying clipped. yes <laughs> to everything, right? If you have them saying yes to everything, you're going to get a call next week. That's like, man, I can't spend this much. But if they're going to say no to you 80 times to keep 20, they're going to be really proud about that 20. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's another thing um, that uh, I studied. I studied with um, uh, I I did some courses from uh, Chris Voss, who's got a great book called um, "Never Split the Difference." Mm. The uh, negotiating as if your life depends on it. Because and one it of does. the things yeah. that yeah yeah, and one of the things that he's always uh, going on about is the power of no. Mm -hmm. as a tool to let your like if you give your client the tool of no in the in the right way then it only strengthens your position yep like like Great book. allowing Great your book. 
Yeah. Like, and like you said, allowing, allowing them to, to say no to things. And, um, and so, yeah, may, that's, that might be something that I adjust. That might indeed, I, I may get, I, I may get less critical of myself because I think it stems from me being critical of myself. If, oh, if totally I don't is. think it's, I don't think it's my best work, then I don't want them to see it because I have, you know, this insecurity. Well, then what if they buy it and then I have to have this floating out there with my name on it, right? Yeah, that's, which is a complex, which is something that I'm sure all of us deal with. Oh, sure. And, but then in that so case, I'm always like, you know what? Like, I know you really like it. Let's see if we can find something similar. I think it's out of focus. Even if you're showing it on a big TV, they're like, what? Oh, okay. Awesome. No, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation and we should definitely do that again sometime. Kat, it was great. I'm sure I, if, uh, if we had no reins on us, I'm sure we could talk for hours longer. Um, absolutely love this conversation. And uh, yeah, I would, uh, I'd love to do this again sometime. Awesome, awesome. Where can people find you online? So you can find me on Instagram at uh, noel.markintel, also noelmarkintel.com. I've got a new website in the works right now, so that's going to be exciting. Also a ton of work. Uh, and then uh, you can find me on Facebook as well, um, but uh, it's the most active platform that I'm on is Instagram. Okay, very cool. And if somebody's looking at Headshot Crew as an option, can they just come and ping you on uh, the Headshot Crew platform? Sure. Yeah. Um, you can go to headshotcrew.com and get started there, or you can shoot me a personal DM. If you want something a little bit more of a, like an introductory type thing, then I would oh, be happy okay, cool. to do that for you. Awesome. No, thank you. Thank you, Kat. Mm -hmm.